Hello everyone, we're going to watch a short clip now and I want you to take notes because we're going to discuss it afterwards. So all the countries in which there are predominantly white people are larger than those in the southern part of the, of the world. If you, get, if you have children going to school and they're seeing this map, right. they're seeing a distortion yeah. of size, of shape, of location, of importance. In order to use this map at all, you have to take this piece, this piece off here, and put it over here. And now you see, the United States is no longer in the middle of the map. Now, I did this with a major record company in New York City, I think in 1970. And an older man stood up in the back of the room and said, Now, Elliot, you've gone too far. I said, What's your problem? You, you can't do that with the map. I said, Well, actually, you can. He said, No, the United States isn't in the middle of the map anymore. I said, The United States never was in the middle of the map. You need to realize this depends on how you draw your map. And then I pointed this little fact out to him. South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. Even though it doesn't really look like it. No, it is! <laughs> South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. It's crazy. Now, according to your social studies teachers, what is the equator? Halfway between the North Pole and the South Pole on this map would be right about here. Right. And that means that Iowa has a semi-tropical climate. <laughs> Well, you've been in Minnesota in the wintertime. I've been in Iowa too, it's definitely You not. know that that's, it doesn't have a tropical climate. So you have to then introduce a real version of the map of the world. I think this is the one. Oh, very good. The Peter's Projection Map. The sizes on this map are right. Hmm. The shapes are distorted. Wow. Look at Greenland on this map. Right there, see it? Yeah, it's really tiny. See how small that is? Right. Look at it on the Mercator projection. So why did they do that? I don't understand. Why? Because the Pope commissioned Mercator to map, to make a map that shows the spread of Christianity. So all the countries in which there are predominantly white people are larger than those in the southern part of the, of the world. Halfway between the North Pole and South Pole. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, get, if you have children going to school and they're seeing this map, right. they're seeing a distortion yeah. of size, of shape, of location, of importance. If they're looking at this map, they're seeing a distorted, shape distorted, but size and location and importance makes sense. This makes no sense. Right. On that map, Alaska is bigger than Mexico. But you know what? We can go further than this. You can go in Google, use the search engine, and type is, insert anything, sexist or racist. And you'll find some interesting results. I personally found that smiling is connected to racismus. But while we can ridicule and laugh at these people all we want, and I'm sure there's an entire industry on the internet doing exactly just that, it's a lot more difficult to actually understand where these people are coming from. Because you see, it's not necessarily that these people are uneducated, because while some of them are, the reality of the issue is that they are using different definitions than other people do. It has gotten to the point where two people speaking the same language can talk about two entirely different things just because academia are muddying and changing definitions. For example, the way right now that is acceptable and it's being proposed as the only possible way of fighting racism and ending racism is an entire academic study called as anti-racism. And this is a, a place where a lot of people are investing a lot of money into companies like Starbucks wanting to teach their employees how to stop being racist will have uh, anti-racism training. Politicians will often spouse uh, anti-racism views. And I think the reason they chose this particular ideology as being the only ideology that can fight racism is because it's very profitable. Let me explain. 
stop doing what you're doing and just pay a little bit of attention because this might open your eyes a little bit. It, it might make you a little bit woke, as they call it. Imagine I had the button right now that if I were to press, racism would disappear from the world. Imagine this interesting hypothesis. How much money do you think I am going to be paid by left-wing activists not to press that button? Because that button will destroy entire industries that are dedicated to fight racism. And these industries make billions of dollars. Just think about it this way. How many politicians would lose their platform if racism would stop existing? How many politicians have their platform dedicated almost entirely on fighting against race? A lot of people would lose their seats. Then you have the private sector. How many companies would have to sack all of the diversity officers? How much people would lose their jobs in social media because they're doing moderation, and they're doing all, all, all forms of censorship. I'm not actually talking about the people on the forums that are actively looking for it. No, 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 like the people that are uh, writing code and writing AI in order how to detect racist memes and whatnot. How many of those people would lose their jobs? How many NGOs would end up unemployed? How many university professors that dedicated their entire life on studying this one field would become obsolete? I think that is an interest in fighting racism, but at the same time, keep racism going. Because money is at stake here. I don't think that a person that has spent three years in a university and paid a lot of money for that university to learn how to be an anti-racist is going to be okay with having to learn how to put bricks and become a builder because their work is obsolete. So I, I think that the reason this ideology is being chosen is precisely because it pretends to fight against racism, but also makes sure that it fuels it enough so that they can constantly fight against it, that it's like a never winning battle. And in this video, I'm going to try to prove it. I'm going to try to make a thesis, and it's based on something that I also found on Twitter, uh, giving proper definitions to it. And I'm going to use the video with the lady of the maps so we can have a conversation and you might notice that this is happening all over around you. So when you hear the word anti-racism, you need to think of it as an academic study, not as something that is actually going to end racism because there's other ways you can fight against racism. There's other tools, there's different ideologies. There are ideologies that encourage it, and there are ideologies that fight against it. So let's try to think of another ideology that is also anti-racist by definition. Let's take the ideology of liberalism that a lot of Americans adhere to. And I'm not talking about liberals as in Democrats. No, the foundations of what constituted as an ideology for the American Constitution. When you look at anti-racism, which has roots in Marxist ideology, and by that I mean, instead of having the privileged class, the bourgeoisie, and the oppressed class, the proletariat, here they switch it around, and the privileged class is whites, and the oppressed class is non-whites. And they view the world from groups. They don't care about individuals. Like, you can be a black person that's going to be ostracized because you're not black enough. Uh, and at the same time, you can be a white person that's in a position of leadership because you're a politician that has a platform that fights against racism. Meanwhile, when you look at liberalism, it employs individualism, tolerant attitudes, and reasoned arguments to minimize prejudice attitudes and discriminatory behavior against individual or groups on the ground of race both in self and others of any race. So on the anti-racist part, you will notice that because of their worldview, every single conservative is a racist. That's what they mean, because you want to maintain the status quo, which is a capitalist society, a meritocracy. And by doing so, they claim that you want to maintain white people in power. And because of that, you're a racist. Meanwhile, the liberal worldview 
treats things differently. Instead of racism, they use the word prejudice. And you can see it actually on the shirt of that lady. And my parents taught me not to be prejudiced. Like, don't be prejudiced towards the homeless. Don't be prejudiced towards people that are less wealthy than you. Basically, it was treat others the way you'd like to be treated. And if this is being pushed on a society, most people are going to treat each other better because it's very difficult to be a dick towards a person that's nice to you. If you have a person that's constantly being nice to you, you find it very difficult to be mean towards that person. I noticed this when I was um, at university. Like there were certain professors that were so nice and, and you could see that they're, they're dedicating their time in order to try to get you to learn that people would be ashamed to go at class without at least studying a little bit for that particular um, particular course. Meanwhile, the worldview of the anti-racist is that, no, it's okay to be prejudiced towards white people because their ancestors did this and this and that. And you can't be racist towards them. So anything you say goes. And I don't see how this causes unison. I don't see how this mends race relations. I, I, I view it as a detriment. Because if someone that you don't know is constantly being antagonistic towards you from default, like from grounds up, like they, they already put you in a box, they already judge you in a way, why would you be nice to that person? Um, and, and you have to also think about it from a different way. You can't weaponize the word prejudice like you can weaponize the word racism. So recently, there is this slogan, all cops are bastards, which I think is the far left uh, equivalent of all Muslims are jihadis. And the ADL actually considers ACAB as a hate uh, symbol. Why? Because skinheads used to use it before this. And now they probably changed the definition. They're like, you should Google it. I, I have it. But they're probably going to say, oh, it's, it's depending on context. But back in the day, it was bikers and skinheads and other people that were, you know, anyway. And you can't tear down a Washington statue. Uh because uh, you're, you're trying to dismantle prejudice. So basically, the way you should look at it, prejudice is a lot more encompassing. Like, the, the, it's a lot bigger. Uh, anti-racism is smaller than prejudice. Because like, you can be prejudiced and you can still be anti-racist. Another thing it's important to look at is how anti-racism adopts an extreme worldview that racializes every human interaction. While liberalism sees some interactions as racialized and others as not racialized. And you can see this taken to the extreme when Domino's Pizza, for example, uh, years ago thanked a woman for her patronage. And now it's found out that that woman, years later, it's found out that that woman is uh, a spokeswoman for Donald Trump and a blue check mark went way back into Domino's Pizza, like they pruned, they actually went through all of their tweets for years and years. And can you imagine like the work that person did in order to find that particular tweet that went, aha. Uh -huh. And then it's threatening uh, Domino's, like this, this is how you ruin your business. Because that woman is a spokesperson for Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a conservative. We already established that conservatives are racist. That woman is a racist. That company is serving racists and therefore, they need to be boycotted. That is the worldview. How is this mending race relations? I don't know. What does it even have to do with race? I don't know, but it does have a lot to do with money, doesn't it? Because now Domino's Pizza has to prove they're not a racist and divert a couple of billion dollars towards some NGOs or, you know, maybe hire a couple of people within their company to make sure that everyone checks their thinking and they can prove that they're not a racist by paying cash. Isn't it such a beautiful money-making ideology, isn't it? Uh, meanwhile, yes, some interactions are racist, of course, others aren't. But now for the left, every single negative interaction between a white person and a non-white person has to do with racism. Like even if, even if let's say you have a car crash and what the person that be, is getting hit, you know, he gets up, he's really angry, he shoves the other person, he, he gets into their face. If it's two white people, there's no trouble. If the person getting shoved is black, oh, 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 racism. 
it's almost like they're mind readers. Like they, they, they manage to see what the person thinks. Anti-racism. Racist until proven innocent, which sometimes is impossible. And liberalism is innocent until racism is proven, which is the foundation of what we use law and justice. When, when we say justice, we're thinking about how to make absolutely sure that we do not condemn innocent people into prison. It's actually like the, the, the most important differentiation between a communist or you know a person that's into authoritarianism and a person that's into freedom. A person that's into authoritarianism is going to say it's better to lock up nine innocent people if we manage to get at least one of them that's guilty. So out of 10 people, we can lock up nine innocent but we get the guilty one, right? The idea is that the guilty person is going to poison the minds of everyone else. Um, meanwhile, for the liberals, it's quite the opposite. It's, it's better to let nine guilty people go than to lock up a single innocent person. And to anyone who disagrees, I would question, would you be the one willing to be locked up so other nine criminals can be locked up as well? Would you be the one doing the sacrifice? What about your mother? What about your loved one? Would you, would you sacrifice them for justice? And it's also the thing that you can't have faith in a justice system that locks up innocent people because then you can be like, well, this guy says he's innocent. Like, what, what if he is? What if he actually is one of those 10? Moving forward, anti-racism denies the possibility of white and white adjacent people ever being not racist due to automatic white complicity in a racist system. While liberalism contends that each individual can choose not to hold racist views and should be expected to do so. In other words, for the anti-racist, there is like this spirit of racismus that looms over society. It's like an evil spirit. It's institutional institutionalized racism is like this evil spirit you can't accurately point at it but it's there it's it's everywhere you know it's like uh god god was omnipresent right so he's everywhere but you can't really point at him because he's all over the place uh and it's a never-ending struggle like there won't be a time like they can't point to a, a single country that doesn't have racism like yeah this is a country that they can't do that uh, meanwhile, in liberalism, yeah, you can have a person that never exposed the racist view, never, you know, did anything wrong. It's, and, and not only that, like, there, there might be cases where a person does something wrong. I mean, hell, we forgive burglars, right? A burglar who is caught goes to prison for a specific number of years, and then when he walks out, we consider him reformed, don't we? But in the eyes of the anti-racists, a person that exposes a racist view is forever condemned. Like, even years in the past, they will go and they'll find, ah. Anti-racism demands a simple-minded commitment to call out and cancel culture, all of its destructive implications for freedom of speech, subtlety in reasoning, and possibility of redemption and forgiveness. While liberalism recognizes that freedom of speech is the best protection of the minority, avoided oversimplification, and sees that issues of race are best dealt with honesty while still working towards a shared goal and a common vision. So this is like the main problem that I have with this anti-racist thinking is that they consider nothing to be sacred. In other words, like when you have human rights, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, all of them can be destroyed if it means we're going to capture a racist. Um, and I, I, I've seen, I don't, I don't even think I need to talk about it. You know, like, for example, with Brett Kavanaugh, they used it for sexism as well. It doesn't have to be racist. With Brett Kavanaugh, it's like, who, who cares about due process? A woman accused him. Now a woman accuses Biden. Oh, due process. You know, no one is above the law. No one is above the law. And then you have the mayor of Seattle going, oh, the, the Capitol Hill zone. Hmm. Oh, that's like the summer of love. That's like, oh, oh. They, they don't have any, like, like it, this, this ideology allows you to not have like a wall that you do not pass. Like something that's set in stone. It's like, no matter how bad things are, we do not cross this line. Like this is a Rubicon. We do not cross it. It's a human right. People should be, you know, allowed and protected. They, no sanctity for anything.
And it's not only that, but I generally don't see how it's working. Like, let's say I really hate a YouTuber. I, I, I'm I very prejudiced against Short Fat Otaku. I can't stand the guy. I, I just can't. And when his subscribers find out that I'm prejudiced against him, they talk to YouTube and they shut down my channel. Do you think I will be more empathetic towards Short Fat Otaku after that experience? Do you think I'm going to change my mind? Or do you think I'm going to be even more prejudiced against him afterwards? And everyone that was reliant on my income, my family, my friends, they're going to find out who did this to me and they're going to be prejudiced as well. Do you, do you not see that this creates more prejudice rather than less? Wouldn't it have been better if I would have just had the conversation with Short Fat Otaku and could, we could work things out? Like it would be like, well, why don't you like me? And I'll be like, well, this and this. And he would be like, well, no, that's not true, blah, blah, blah. So this is why I view anti-racism as a way of fostering racism and, and making sure that it still exists in order for the diversity officer to still have a job, in order for the NGO to still have donations, in order for the politician to still have a platform. Uh, and also the idea of um, redemption and forgiveness doesn't exist. Like I haven't seen, name me a single person, one person that apologized and people were like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, okay, he made a mistake. Or like, when, when is the time where you can be like, yeah, no, he messed up, but it's been like five years now, come on. So it's the complete destruction of the individual. Nothing less. Like it doesn't matter. Like until this guy is on the streets and begging and unemployed, it's still not good enough. Uh, and it makes people feel justified and moral when they do this. My God, like I, I, I couldn't view myself doing this to a black person. You know, like even uh, some of the speakers on the far left, I wouldn't be able to, to try and do this to AOC or someone like that, <clears throat> to like know that she, she's now on the streets begging for food. It's because, and I had something to do with that. Like I, I can't picture myself, it, it's wrong. I, I, I just don't have it in me. Anti-racism encourages discrimination based on race while liberalism encourages universally upholding the principle of not discriminating based on race. And finally, anti-racism requires commitments to social activism that is lifelong and ongoing no one is ever done. They actually say this. It's like religion. You're born with the sin and for your entire life you have to commit and one single mistake and you're up. While liberalism requires no commitment to social activism, just be yourself and treat people as you want to be treated. So you can look at these two main ways of thinking, two ideologies, and you can conclude for yourself which one do you agree more with. Um, what I find interesting about the lady with the maps is that you can see how the ideology on the left perverts her entire worldview. And this is why it doesn't make sense because right now I think this, these are like the two main categories of people that you have in political discourse. You have the left, the anti-racist, and you have the liberals. And whenever they're talking, they're talking past each other because they're using different definitions and different principles and way of thinking. So when the lady with the map says, well, this map is the way it is because racism, like, look, these white predominant countries are bigger. It, it, like she is using the idea that it's guilty until proven innocent. It's like, no, they purposely made the white countries bigger. Racism. Uh, the Pope, Kov Merkador, the Pope wanted Christianity to look uh, like it's important. It's like, okay, but even assuming that's true, Christianity is a religion. Like there's white people that are Muslims, there's black people that are Christians. It's got nothing to do with race. And secondly, it still doesn't explain why we use the map in 2020. We use the map in 2020 for the same reason we use Arabic numbers. Because if people were indeed racist and they would only care about, you know, like things white people came up with, then we would use Roman numerals. But we don't use Roman numerals because they're not as effective and as good as Arabic numbers. Believe it or not, there's more than the Mercador maps out there. Like there's several types of maps. We use this one out of convenience and because we decided it's an international standard. If you want, you can use something else. And kids in school are taught about this. Like I was taught about it in fourth grade at geography. But again, like notice how she assumes that everything is racist. Everything has to be racist. Uh, so that she gets to be put in a position of power to dictate to other people how they need to behave. It's 
the when I look at the one in the left, it's not an ideology about ending racism. It's an idea, despite the fact that it's called anti-racist. It's actually about making wealth, making money, and gaining power. That's all that is. Because the moment you are the person that's in charge, you get to make decision. And if it would actually end racism, then that person wouldn't be in charge anymore. So, yeah, this is my analysis. Uh, let me know what you think, and I'll see you guys later.